Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to the inaugural Museum Group Online Conversation. I'm Paul Orselli. I'll be the host this afternoon. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Museum Group. The Museum Group is a consortium of independent museum consultants. Our mission is to work with museums to help them achieve their greatest potential in an ever-changing world. And you can find out more about our work at museumgroup.com. Well, this afternoon, we're in for a treat. We have Marsha Semmel, who is also a member of the museum group and an independent consultant, and Jane Werner, the executive director of the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. They're together in conversation uh, around Marsha's new book, Partnership Power. They'll share their experiences with a variety of partnerships and take it away, Jane and Marsha. Thank you so much, Paul. It's really a privilege to be part of this inaugural museum group webcast um, talking about my book, Partnership Power, Essential Museum Strategies for Today's Network World. Uh, the reason that I wrote this book was because as I looked around, I saw a lot of museum literature focused on museum school partnerships. I didn't see nearly as much around museum community partnerships. And I thought that uh, by looking at some existing partnerships and getting some partnership perspectives, I could add something to the field. I also believe that um, it's incredibly important to put out there all the ways in which museums are part of the community, essential community members, essential uh, institutions in the larger community ecosystem. Uh, also, I think the reason I added the networked piece is that I think, especially on the part of funders and influencers and political leaders, increasingly we're seeing um, them requiring a systems approach to addressing community needs that gets reflected in their funding proposed uh, priorities, in the way they're looking at measuring impact. And so again, I wanted to highlight the fact that these are not one-off partnerships but in my examples that I highlight, and of course there are many more, um, museums play a role in addressing larger community needs. I came to this um, realization from my own experience, especially my work at Women of the West Museum, where not having a physical structure meant that I had to uh, develop partnerships with many community organizations. And in my 10 years as the Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Includes uh, something about my partnership journey. There's a section on how to use the book. And then I've got 12 partnership profile case studies, which includes, oh, can you backtrack, Paul? Paul? Yeah, so there are 12 partnership case studies, which include museums of different types, disciplines, and geographic locations. I have 14 partnership perspectives, which are by uh, researchers, funders, people who work in the library and uh, in the larger museum ecosystem world and then a whole series of tools and tips and resources. I think the most important two things to say is that the book is really a series of journeys, of partnership journeys. It has a lot of practical advice, but it is not a linear book. And my hope is that people will just dip into that book at places that interest them and uh, get something out of it. I'm in the process of developing some related websites. Paul, could you switch the slide then? Uh, in the book, there are two examples uh, from Pittsburgh. One in the partnership perspective section is a piece by Greg Baer, uh, who is the director of the Grable Foundation and has been one of the leading 
Pittsburgh Voices Around the Remake Learning Network. Uh, and as he points out in his perspective, uh, the city of learning idea actually was born in the basement of the Pittsburgh Children's Museum. Actually, it was a cafe, but then it ended up, yeah, there were five in the cafe. <laughs> So, and, and Greg uh, has a wonderful description of how it has grown and developed along with some specific resources. And then, of course, it was essential that I invite Jane Werner and Suzanne McCaffrey from the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh to write about their long history and continuing involving history of developing partnerships to transform the museum, as well as the neighborhood and the entire, I would say, regional learning landscape. So I'm, I was thrilled when I reached out, Jane was the first person I reached out to when we talked about creating this uh, webcast, this inaugural TMG webcast. And even though she is incredibly busy, of course, with a big project launching next week, uh, she said yes. So Jane, thank you very much. And why don't you take it away with the images and the story you want to tell before we launch into our conversation? Sure. Thanks, Marsha. It's really nice of you to include us. Um, so, you know, our story is a, a long time in the making. And that's the thing that whenever I'm speaking to people, I, I always want to say, look, it's taken a really long time to get to where we are and we're still not done. Um, so go ahead, Paul, you can. So I always start with a children's museum mission statement whenever I do almost anything, including all staff meetings and board meetings, because I think it grounds us. And we only usually use the, that first sentence, um, and that's the sentence that we all memorize. But the second part of it actually is all about being a partner and a resource for people who work with or on behalf of children, youth, and families. And we do that in a number of ways. Um, go ahead, Paul. When we actually expanded the museum in 2004, we actually included partners in the project. Uh, so the Pittsburgh Public Schools has two pre-K programs here. Half the kids are Head Start, half the kids are not Head Start. Um, Saturday Life Brigade, which is a radio show um, that's done uh, for families on Saturday mornings, but it's much more than that. They actually go into the schools and help kids write and record their stories. Allies for Children is a child advocacy group, Reading is Fundamental, and then Up Close, uh, University of Pittsburgh Center for Learning and Out of School Environments. We actually had a number of other partners that we started with, and they've come and gone, um, and we kind of acted as an incubator. Uh, the Tunzeum actually started here and then got their own place downtown. That has since kind of fallen away, um, and it's a much smaller organization. Um, we also started a Storehouse for Teachers, which was the place where teachers could go to get um, uh, supplies, and that has just blossomed and thrived. Um, up Close is a little bit different now because we actually have our own Department of Learning and Research, so we actually took the people from, uh, that were graduating from the University of Pittsburgh and we employ them now. So uh, that relationship has changed, although it's kind of morphing into something else. And that's the other thing that's interesting about partnerships is they're constantly changing, just absolutely constantly changing. And you gotta be okay with that. You kinda gotta go with the flow. You got personalities change, people change. Um, and so it's just, it's been great. Uh, we've learned a lot from them. Okay, go ahead. Um, so that worked out so well, we decided to look at partnerships outside of our, outside of our building. And in 2007, we uh, launched the Charm Bracelet Project. And it was this network of, uh, as you can see, cultural, educational, recreational organizations transforming traditional understandings of how institutions make community impact. Now that's a lot, I, those are a lot of words, but it all was on the north side of Pittsburgh. And what we were looking for were the connections from a marketing point of view, from a um, urban design point of view, and from a programmatic point of view. But not um, like a programmatic, like the aviator bringing a bird over here, which would be very nice. We were looking at how do we use our strengths as cultural institutions. Um, and it was an NEA funded project. Um, Paul, go ahead. 
Um, we started with these institutions on the north side, so you can see that they were kind of various scales, um, and it just kept growing to where we had, you know, a hundred different organizations who were participating in this project. Um, and it was, in some ways, we were looking at how networks could really uh, be impactful. Um, and in some ways, this was also kind of the start of Remake Learning. Um, because Greg Bear had funded our work in the Charm Bracelet Project and saw how if we actually all partnered together, we can make bigger impact. Okay, go ahead. The first thing that we did was that the Warhol and the Children's Museum went together and reopened this closed theater. This is the Hazlet Theater. This opened in 2007. Um, we raised two and a half million dollars. We formed a board. Um, we uh, actually got the 501c3 and we launched this the children's museum actually did all of the finances for the first five years of this theater and the uh, warhol did the programming um, but since then we actually the warhol and the children's museum are, are kind of out of this um, so again it was how do we use our stripes to start something and do something good in the community this is a thriving theater now okay go ahead um, the park in front of the Children's Museum was a public park that was just in complete disarray, not well taken care of. So uh, the Children's Museum took that on, raised six and a half million dollars, um, did another design competition for this park, which has become kind of a community center. And then we basically gifted it back to the city. Uh, we actually hold um, a maintenance fund. So in fact, I just passed the guys out there mowing the lawn and doing some mulching um, that we pay for. So, okay, go ahead. So, you know, we kept doing these partnerships and they kept being such a rich partnership. You know, that was with the city. We worked with the Warhol. Um, and we're kind of out of space. Uh, we're now seeing over 315,000 people in our museum, which was designed for 150,000. And we kept looking at the building next door to us, and we kept also thinking about how we wanted to kind of go deep in education and understand how the informal world and the formal world bump up against each other and what we could learn from each other. So we're creating this new, or um, actually it's a new museum for older kids right next door. Um, it's called Museum Lab, it has a separate logo, separate identity from the Children's Museum. In fact, we're not even saying it's part of the Children's Museum. And um, we are looking at kind of taking partnerships and going deep. Okay, next slide. Um, our in-house partners on this project are Manchester Academic Charter School. It's a middle school, 95% of the kids are African-American, 94% are free reduced lunch. Carnegie Mellon actually is going to put three different programs in this uh, project, the Entertainment Technology Center, um, is really going to do all the tech uh, education and kind of put their newest and greatest things that they're looking around tech and ed education, mostly around gaming. Um, but we also have the arts management class, has the arts management program has a desk over there, as well as IDA, which is a cross-disciplinary program from Carnegie Mellon. University of Pittsburgh School of Education is putting grad students there. Um, Allegheny Health Network is putting a pediatric office and allies for children who are now in this building will be moving over to that building. Go ahead. So this is a very interesting building. It uh, was the first Carnegie Library ever commissioned. It's sat vacant now for a number of years. In the 70s, they ripped out um, all of the Victorian uh, frou-frou, <laughs> the plaster work, and they put drop ceilings in, took out staircases. And basically what we're doing is um, we're, we're creating kind of a beautiful ruin. On the first floor, it's public space. On the second floor, um, Manchester Academic Charter School will be going. And then on the ground floor, that's where all of our partners will be. So the, comp the, the notion is, can we take, do experiments? Can we make small bets down in the informal world? And can we actually have these conversations with the formal classroom? Can we actually learn from each other? and then have the University of Pittsburgh and uh, our research and development department really kind of look at um, and document those things. Okay, next. So these are the public areas within this space um, that we are going to the public um, museum lab spaces. We're very excited by it. 
you have to come see it. It's very cool. It opens a week from today. So if I seem a little frazzled, it's because it's open for a week from today. Go ahead. And, the, and, and you can see over to the right um, is this library building where Museum Lab is going. The Children's Museum is directly in front of us with the three buildings from three different centuries. The park is in front of that. The library is connected to Museum Lab. And I think that when this opens next week, with all of our partners, we'll have created kind of this, uh, one of the largest cultural campuses for children in the United States. So we're really excited by it. And that's what we're up to. And, you know, we really believe in the power of partnerships um, because you can actually make bigger, a bigger difference by actually using other people's expertise and learning from each other. Um, so that's the Children's Museum story at this point. Great. Thanks. <laughs> that was great. So um, now we move into the live action <laughs> section of the uh, session. And Jane and uh, Marcia, take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Paul. And I, I know that looking at the people who are participating in this web webinar, I know not one of you is shy. So I hope that you start populating the chat room with some questions, because this is really about what are some of the issues you want to talk about? Um, I'll get us started, but uh, please, please uh, weigh in with, you know, any questions that are on your mind about Museum Lab or about um, the Children's Museum and partnerships, um, uh, you know, generally. Um, I, Jane, one of the things uh, you write about in the piece in my book is something called um, your New Ideas Fund. And I wondered if you could just share, I don't, I had not heard about that before, even though I followed a lot of the things the Children's Museum has done. Would you tell us a little bit about how that got started and how it, you use it now? Sure, actually it goes back to the Grable uh, Foundation and Greg Bear. Um, we're all kind of, in Pittsburgh, we're all good friends. It's a small enough town that once you know one person, you pretty, not, pretty much know everyone. Um, but it actually came out of our work with the charm bracelet. Um, they were very interested um, in kind of how uh, we had created this network. And in probably one of the best days of my career, and the only time I think I've ever cried at work, um, Greg just called me up and said, you know, can I come over and see you? And I said, sure, why not? And uh, came walking in and he sat down at my desk and he said, okay, this is, or sat down at my table and I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, we're going to give you, uh, I don't know what it was, $500,000 for general operating over two years and we're going to do this and we're going to give you $250,000 to pursue ideas. And um, truly, it was the only time I've ever really cried at work. I mean, I, I just kind of burst into tears because, first of all, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you're lying. And he's like, no, no. Um, and, you know, we, to, you know, it was one of the most wonderful things that, you know, people basically say, we believe in you, you know. And um, we did so much with that $250,000. Um, we actually pursued more of the charm bracelet projects. We um, also invested in a new media department. We just kept investing in things, uh, small bets, again, small bets. It's better than the endowment. I mean, we actually figured that for every dollar we spent out of the new ideas fund, we either earned or raised another seven. So the return on investment is pretty, pretty amazing. So these small bets on big ideas. Now, believe me, we had some disasters. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you a couple of things that we invested in. I was like, oh, I didn't work. But you know, you should be allowed to fail. We talk about that all the time, but nobody ever gives you money to actually fail, um, to try things to fail. Um, so we now actually make that part of our um, operating budget. We actually put a percent towards the new ideas budget every year. You have to kind of have discipline to do that. And uh, since that time, we also have gotten a, a large grant from an anonymous foundation in town, which created a growth capital fund it's a really long, long um, story, but this growth capital fund, we have ready access 
to, to create exhibits that travel. And when they travel, half the money goes back into general operating, 40% goes into um, the growth capital fund and 10% goes into the new ideas fund. Great. So it's like this, we just keep putting money in. Um, the board sometimes refers to, refers to it as Jane's slush fund. The finance chair does not like when that happens. <laughs> but it is a, a, something that uh, you know we all have ready access to um, to try out ideas. Right, because I you know I think one of the questions that always comes up is, are these partnerships sustainable? You know, how do you manage them in terms of the budget? Uh, and this, I, you know, I think this is a really interesting idea that continues to pay off. Um, Paul, can I ask the question that uh, just appeared, or do you want to? You, no, you, you, you have the control. You and Jane have the control. All right. Well, this <laughs> <Finally. is> <laughs> think of it. Think of it as your question slush fund <laughs> for the next forty minutes or so. But uh, uh, Janine Bryant raises a really great question um, where she says, there's a lot of use of the word we in the presentation. What obstacles challenged your concept of collaboration before you got to the we? And I, one of the reasons I like that question is there's a we that has to do with you in, in the museum staff and the museum board. And there's the we that has to do with your various partners and supporters. Yeah. Well, I will say that, you know, partnerships change, right? I mean, when, um, like, we do not have a terribly good relationship with the Warhol as we did when we were doing um, the charm bracelet in the theater, and that was because the executive director has moved on. And um, the executive director and I were friends. So, you know, we could dream up things we were talking the same language, and he was interested in community work. I, you know, you do have to kind of pick the, the, the partners and you have to, you have to be okay to let it go to like, okay, well, we're not working too much with the Warhol anymore. That's okay. There's always someone else to work with. Um, and so that's been kind of, it's the thing that you get to, you know, you kind of have to mourn a little bit, but then you move on um, because there's someone else who, you know, is, is, is interesting, interesting and wants to work with you. And, um, that was a hard thing for, I think, me to learn. Um, I actually thought, why wouldn't you want to work with the Children's Museum? And then I, can't, and then I realized, that, oh yeah, some people, it's not in their, it's not in their vision of, of their organization. And that's okay. I mean, you know, there's, it's just the way it goes. Um, and yeah, sometimes, I mean, everybody pays rent um, to the Children's Museum, the low market rent, who rents space from us. Um, like things fluctuate, like right now, um, the preschool and what we're doing with the preschool in this building is fabulous. There have been times when it has not been because of the pressures of school um, or who the teachers are. So, you know, again, I think you just have to kind of go along for the ride and, and when it works, it's great. I will say that right now we have culture. We're trying to figure out the culture of the middle school. Um, schools are very different than museums, yeah. um, and that has been really, you have to keep a sense of humor about it, um, and when you get mad, you have to say, hey, I'm really mad, and these are the reasons why I'm really mad, and, and your partners, is, I think as long as you're kind of, um, your honest self and open and straightforward, you can kind of get through almost everything, but then there's some times where it's just like, okay, well, it's not working. It's okay, we can move on, you know. Uh, yeah, I think that dynamic piece is really, really important. Um, someone once said to me, you know, there's the partnership and then there's the sticky residue that you can shape into the next thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's okay. And it may look very different from what you started with. But yeah, I think there's another question from Margaret. Um, what one or two thoughts or advice would you give to a leader at a small museum who wants to develop and nurture a small partnership? How would you suggest they start? Start small. I mean, do like one or two programs, really. You really get to know the, your partner um, if it's going to, if you think it's going to develop into something deep. I will say that, you know, some of the partners that we've had here, um, the reading is fundamental executive director 
who is right above me. Um, she, you know, it's a small organization and we have gotten to be good friends over the years. Um, and it's been great to have another executive director, even if it's kind of tangential to what we do, it's great to have an executive director to bounce ideas off of. Or whenever she walks into my office and closes the door, I think, oh, this is gonna be good. Because we've all had those days where you just want to vent. And um, you know, it's, it's nice that you can have somebody to do that because there's nobody on staff. And your husband, my husband, your spouse gets tired of hearing you vent. Um, so it's nice to have someone um, you know, that you, you actually can get to know that way. Here, let's see this. Thanks, Jane. Uh, so so uh, speaking of your husband, uh, not what are the characteristics of your ideal mate, but what are the characteristics of your ideal partner? <laughs> I think they're both the same. If you want to start with your husband, go ahead. <laughs> I, think they're, I think in some ways they're the same. You want some real calm, uh, very, you know, has a good sense of humor, thinks you're wonderful. <laughs> Um, no, I, you know, it's, it's really been uh, the partners that we have are the partners that really do, um, you know, you, you're your honest self back and forth to each other. I mean, that you can actually just say, um, you know, how about this idea? And they can tell you, no, no, that won't work. Or, or yeah, let's, let's pursue that. Or like, hey, I have an idea. Um, those are the kinds of partnerships that I love, you know, when there, there's a kind of a synergy back and forth about ideas. And I think being open to, the, to that and having partners who are also want to try things. Let's try, let's, let's try it, let's see, let's, let's, let's experiment. It's, it's not a lot of fun when your partner's like, uh, no, you know, I think you, I was, but that's also, I think the Children's Museum, we're always looking for creative partners, so. So there are a couple of questions and comments about the importance of proximity. You know, whether the, how important proximity, as in I'm assuming geographic proximity and an existing relationship is to these partnerships. I'm curious about that too, because I know that you're, you've extended your reach, I know even into West Virginia and uh, you've done some national things. So. How does that compute in terms of your relationships and partnerships, Jane? Yeah, I think those are different partnerships because the partners that you see every day, you, um, it's kind of different. I, I, um, the partnerships that are more long distance, um, there's a difference between seeing somebody when you're grabbing a cup of coffee every day than there is in talking to someone once a month or, I mean, we have partnerships even in Wilkinsburg, which is, a, you know, kind of one of those ring suburbs of Pittsburgh where we have kind of a, a, um, a satellite museum at Hosanna House. Um, and that, you know, even though Leon is a good friend of mine, I don't see, I might see him twice a year in person. You know, we talk all the time, we feel that on the phone, but it's not it quite the same as the daily kind of interaction that we have with Saturday Light Brigade, where I can say to the executive director, or we can say to the executive director, hey, we have um, an all staff party coming up. Can you provide the sound support? You know, do you guys want to come up and, you know, um, participate in whatever we're doing? And that's the other great thing is that you always have, and they, they come to us, like Allies for Children just did a huge initiative uh, to try to get a tax for, in Pittsburgh, a small little tax for uh, preschool. And um, we were at the place that they launched it. We actually had the petition signings here. And it's easier to just kind of make that happen because they're right next door. Yeah. The bigger projects, you know, we are doing a lot in West Virginia. Um, and, it's because, and that is just absolutely fascinating, a totally different audience. Um, and really good people in West Virginia, but it's um, more episodic. So you kind of, you do more of the program rather than going deep. Here we actually go deep um, because of the proximity. Um, I think that's And And um, we have a couple more questions, but I, I, this might be a good place to just mention for those of you on the, on the call who haven't followed this, um, 
Jane's museum was right on top of or incredibly responsive to the massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue. Um, and, you know, so there seems to be an esprit, there's a spirit it, it, that um, I'm sure, you know, you embody Jane, uh, Jane, but it seems to be a collective spirit and your staff and board that recognize that this community deep role is really part of what you do. I mean, it's a priority, it's part of your DNA. Do you wanna say anything more about that, that cultural piece? Uh, yeah, you know, so we were lucky enough. Um, I was lucky enough to work with Fred Rogers. So um, for a number of years. And so I often think that the Children's Museum, and he worked with the staff here, um, really is, you know, I sometimes say, that we're Mr. Rogers is our spirit animal. And then I think, I wonder how Fred would feel about that. Um, but, you know, it, there are so many times where, he, you know, we reference Fred, not in a weird, like, what would Fred do? Because he would never have wanted that. And people get that all wrong. Um, he would he would say, well, what do you want to do, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of an odd, somehow Fred's message gets a little yeah. warped. Um, the tree of life thing was really interesting and I've never been, I, I have the best staff in the world and I have the best board in the world. I am, I am truly blessed. Um, and when the tree of life happened, you know, it was in my neighborhood. I mean, I, the synagogue is probably five blocks away from where I live. And um, my husband actually had passed by probably five minutes before the shooting started. Um, so it really, you know, hit home literally. And um, we were trying to figure out how, what to do. Um, and almost immediately, I would say by three o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon, we had decided to be free for the, the free admission for the week. Because I realized that, um, you know, the, the media was just gonna be all over this. And we wanted to have a safe place for kids to go and families to go. So we were, we were free and that worked out really well, but um, we all met as a staff on Monday morning and um, the staff had this, it was really fascinating conversation um, about what else we could do. And we landed on the fact that we had done an exhibit on love and forgiveness, XOXO, that's traveling the country. And um, we decided um, with new ideas money to um, actually do a pop-up version of it. Uh, which we produced in two weeks time, maybe even a week and a half time, um, and immediately deployed it throughout the community. And it still has been going throughout Pittsburgh. Um, it was a, it's at the Frick Nature Reserve right now, but it had been at the uh, community, Jewish Community Center. It's been to Wilkinsburg, to Hosanna House. It's been at the Food Bank. It's been just named, been in a couple of libraries, but it's been throughout Pittsburgh. And it's all talks about like, how do you actually, how do you actually love and how do you think about love and it gives you the space to talk to your kids about love? And then how do you, how do you actually forgive? Which is the harder part of it all. Um, so the thought is that whenever um, tragedy happens and I knock on wood and I, maybe, oh, it's, you know, realistically it will pro probably happen again that we'll be able to deploy this to another city. So we'll be able to deploy some love to, to a city that kind of had the same awful thing happen to it that happened to Pittsburgh. So yeah. that's how we respond. It's just, but I think it just goes to the roots of, of being um, in Pittsburgh too. Pittsburgh is a town that, you know, let's face it, up until a couple of years ago, I don't know how we got hip, but now we're hip. Um, yeah. uh, so it, it was, it's, been a down on its luck kind of city for a long time and we've all had to work together and we've all had to figure things out and um that's the thing i love most about pittsburgh is that we work at, we all work at it we all know that there are problems there are issues and pittsburgh still has a bunch of problems and issues but we're working at it um, well and as you said uh, when you were talking uh, over your slides this is not something that's happened overnight either your journey or pittsburgh's journey and as a detroiter 
you know, yeah. watching what's happening in that city, you know, I, it's been incredibly inspirational to see what's happening in Pittsburgh and to see some turning now in my hometown. So, you know, um, there's a question from Polly McKenna Cress about um, what happens when you uh, at the museum and your partner start to diverge over process? Have you experienced this? And, you know, I think you and I have talked about the fact, I mean, a bumper sticker for my book would be something like, it's the relationship, stupid. <laughs> <You know? laughs> or I would leave off the stupid, it's the relationship. <laughs> but, um, you know, I've been in the situation where I have made assumptions about, I'm very clear about what I want to do and what the vision is. And I've tried to ensure that that's the case with my perspective and actual partner. And, you know, sometimes I've just hit a, a, a pothole and we've had to go back a couple of steps before we move forward. But I wonder if you could talk a little about that, your process, and when that you hit those points. Yeah, I mean, you know, we try to, do, to be upfront um, from the very beginning too, but the, there, are, there are some real potholes. I, this Museum Lab project is probably the most difficult project I've ever done in my life because, you know, when we were doing this expansion, um, the partners kind of came after. Like they kind of looked at their space and said, yeah, well, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll rent space from you at this great price. You know, that's a great idea. Um, so that was easier than what we did this time around, which was actually involve the partners in the design process. And frankly, I probably shouldn't talk about this this today of all days because yesterday I was so angry at the school. I was like, I'm not paying for your cable trays. Um, yeah, so I mean, the financial thing is the thing that you have to iron out because the finance is almost just like a marriage. We'll sink it. If you're not, if you're not clear about like, all right, you're paying for this, I'm paying for this, especially when you're building something together. I would recommend never building anything with anyone at any time. Like, just, just do it yourself. Um, yeah, and I have uh, this, again, this museum lab project needed a couple of um, timeouts where we all had to go get beer, frankly. You know, where I was like, we have to remember we're doing this for kids. We have to remember the bigger picture. We're not going to argue over this money. We're not going to, who cares about the money? We'll figure that out. Let's keep the focus. Let's pull back, pull back, pull back. Um, but when somebody is standing there with cable trays and say, say well, they told me to put this up and you're going to pay for it. You're like, <laughs> hard to remember the kids. Um, so yeah, I, it's tough. I mean, it is really hard, but you know, you, you just have to muscle through it. Something else that Pittsburghers are good at, like, all right, we're gonna do it and we're gonna open this and, and then we'll figure out the cable charts. Um, so yeah, just trying to pull back, I think sometimes and say, oh yeah, what's the big idea here? What are we trying to do? Oh, right, we're gonna try to change education, you know, using, right, so it's, um, it's hard to do. Um, it, yeah, this is this is not a good day to ask that question. <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting. There, there's one of the perspectives in the book is by Elise Edman uh, Ad, uh, Adol, who runs the National Writing Project, and her piece is about Sharky's Bar, and she calls it partnerships as the great third place, and how when she was in the throes of a very complicated partnership. What saved them was going to Sharky's Bar every week. <laughs> it just was that third place where um, they could move forward. And you know, Laura wanted Laura Roberts has a question, but she wanted to know whether you went out by yourself drinking or you <laughs> went out with the partners drinking. Sometimes, so <laughs> no, it was with the partners. It was with the partners, and you know what? At the end of it, we all had a good time. Um, at the end of the evening. But yeah, I mean, there were times I really did think that drinking alone could, could take me down a really dark path. <laughs> well, I'm really, thank you for your candor. That was great. I think, that, you know, we have to look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of all this stuff. Um, Laura, Laura's main question, I think, 
was really about, you know, the civic and philanthropic uh, infrastructure in Pittsburgh. And, you know, we've, you and I have both talked about uh, Greg Bear, who is kind of an amazing saint, who <laughs> runs the Grable Foundation. But um, can you talk a little about other partners who have joined into some of these philanthropic, philanthropic activities? Sure. Um, so, you know, Pittsburgh was the Silicon Valley of the turn of the last century. So if you think about Carnegie was here, Frick was here. I mean, actually all the great art was here. Mellon was here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so all this money was actually um, made in Pittsburgh. And the great thing is that it stayed. Um, there are a number of very large foundations between the Heinz Endowments and the R.K. Mellon Foundation and the Hillman Foundation and uh, Grable to a smaller extent, um, really, you know, kind of substantial foundations. And it is really a blessing um, here in Pittsburgh. And we're a small city with an amazing philanthropic com community. Um, but we also have, um, the state has been very generous to the Children's Museum. So we have, um, these projects are put together through a number of um, foundation, as well as state funding. Um, individual donations are where we kind of fall uh, off the map as far as Pittsburgh, as all of Pittsburgh. It's just um, individual uh, individuals do not give because they know the foundations are there. Um, so, and I think it's interesting times for corporations. We used to be the third largest corporate headquarters in the United States with a very great philanthropic community there. Um, corporations, uh, I think, across the board are not giving like they used to. I think they're sitting on, on their money because I don't think, I think they don't know what's going to happen um, in the next couple of years to the market. So it's, um, it's been really interesting. And so this project was really put together, the Museum Lab project was put together between state money, state funding, I think we got you know, maybe a million and a half in state funding, foundation funding, our board was very generous. Um, and that's usually pretty much how it shakes out. Some individuals, but not, not huge individual gift. Um, so it's, although we did just, I mean, we finished the campaign just two weeks ago with a very large gift from uh, Bank of America, a million dollar gift from Bank of America, who was moving into Pittsburgh. And this was a grant that we didn't even ask for. Um, so we had actually got to know the folks from Bank of America and they, they believe so much in the project that um, the corporate office gave us a million dollars. And we finished the campaign. We were short $700,000 and uh, so yeah, it was kind of one of those miracle things that happens. You're like, wow. That is fantastic. Did you, yeah. that, that actually, I guess, deserves champagne, maybe uh, instead of a beer? Or yeah. Beer. <laughs> we did our little money dance here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Dale McCready has a question I, that's a, a good one uh, with kind of a series of questions. Uh, and I'm not surprised that they're coming from Dale. Um, as we think about building our capacity to be more culturally competent, in what ways has this agenda been incorporated into your new work and through your partnerships, this cultural competency? What will be the evidence of your successes across Pittsburgh? Well, <laughs> thanks, Dale. <laughs> no, I would not have, I didn't even have to credit Dale, and I think you would know that that question came from Dale. <laughs> um, well, actually, that part, it goes back to this partnership thing, uh, right? We learn so much from our partners. Um, you know, last year we were doing this project um, it, during the summer with the kids from Manchester Academic Charter School and um, Antoine Rose, I don't know if everybody here knows about Antoine Rose, but here in Pittsburgh, uh, yet another um, African-American 17 year old or 19 year old who was shot by the police. Um, and, you know, it's so, that was so fascinating to be working with Manchester Academic Charter kid, School kids, and they're, they're sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, right? So they are totally, um, totally aware of what's happening. Obviously, they're older. They're you know they're articulate. They're really 
involved. And it was, it, it was real education for us to see that age kid get so involved in such a big social issue. Um, and it's been, it's been great. I mean, the kids are really teaching us a lot. Um, and we're learning cultural competency from, you know, tweens, teenagers, um, which has been great. And it's actually made us think differently about how we approach things. Um, so that's, that's been good. The teachers have, you know, and, and I think across the board, our partnerships keep teaching us. And I think it's the conversations have been really rich. Yeah. Um, how we're going to measure what our success is, I, I don't know. You know, like sometimes I think we just need to do the work. We do have this department of learning and research that documents our work, but sometimes um, I think just doing the work actually reveals, reveals things um, and takes you in different directions because of, of the work. So you do the work, you study the work, and then you're like, well, that's interesting. Let's pursue that. Um, can we make a bigger impact here? And, you know, this, again, as I mentioned, the staff here is just fabulous and kind of really thinking deeply about the work and then how to actually translate it onto the floor, which I, I so admire our Department of Research and Learning and Education and how, and exhibits for that matter, but uh, the people on the floor know the stuff. They know the research. They know why we do the things we do. They know what the principles of practice are in the workshop. They know the principles of practice in the um, studio. And, you know, we're just doing, launching this new project that came out of, um, uh, we've been messing around with it for a while, around kindness. And they actually have developed principles of practice around kindness. So if Pittsburgh can get to be a kinder city, maybe we'll know that we actually no. have something there. I don't know if I answered that question. It's, no, I that I, I wondered just to go back to the when you were saying you've learned some specific things from those middle school kids are there is there anything you want to share about that i mean are there a couple of were there a couple of surprises that have come up as you address this particular age group yeah um so i've been working with kayla and layla um two of the kids they're 14 from manchester academic and they're actually helping me with a project where we're going through our collection and finding artifacts to put into um, these nooks and crevices in the um, museum lab project. First of all, I had forgotten how much drama is involved when you're 14 <laughs> and a girl. Man, and I have boys, so I'm like, oh my God, there's so much drama. I'm learning a lot about social media and I am learning about how social media like they're showing me things on their on their social media feed, I guess. It, it's not Instagram, it's uh, Snapchat, you know, and they're, anyway, it's just, I feel so old. I mean, you know, they just, it's so fascinating how they communicate and what they're communicating. And, um, and I also am really impressed with how socially aware they are and how they're really getting involved, you know, in, in bigger issues. Um, yeah. Did your whole staff watch Eighth Grade, the movie Eighth Grade? No, but we should. <laughs> you really should. You really should. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Maureen has a question about, um, for me, about the, my choice of museums and what has happened since these case studies were written. Um, has there been any turnover in leadership? Um, do I have a sense of how those kinds of transitions have or might impact this work? And how mature do the partnerships need to be to sustain that kind of change? As far as I know, there has been no change in leadership in any of the institutions that um, I chose to uh, emphasize. Uh, each one, one of my criterion for selecting each one was the kind of long, authentic, uh, over time um, museum community partnership. So um, there wasn't a single museum I chose that was just sort of dipping their toe into partnership for the first time and I chose to write about them. And um, 
whether it was the Explora Museum in Albuquerque or the or OMSI in Oregon or um, the Jewish Museum of Maryland, in each case, um, this has been kind of a long and winding road and I tried very hard and I, I uh, and people were incredibly open about sharing um, those potholes that we've discussed. So, um, and happy to talk further about it, but to me that's one, that was one of the interesting pieces of the book. I think when it, an executive director changes, yeah, lots of things change. Um, it, I, in every one of these case studies, you had to have someone in a leadership role with some power who was able to say, this is our North Star and this is real work. It's not something you do in addition to your real job. Uh, but, and there are many more examples uh, beyond the ones that I chose in the book. So um, it is, let's see, it is close to three, I think my cell phone, but um, I, so we're getting the, the cue to uh, wrap up a bit. I, I, you know, Jane, my last uh, question really does get to this organizational culture and also the structure. When you're opening Museum Lab, if it's a separate brand, are you the director now of two museums? Or how are you doing that? If you don't mind my asking, I haven't asked you that before. No. Yeah. Um, so the way it, it's structured, is it's the same board. It's the same management team. Yeah, I am sort of the director of two museums. But it's right next door. I mean, it's, you know, in fact, it's my new exercise program, just walking between the two. <laughs> um, so Chip, or, uh, Chip Lindsay, who is our education director, is actually located at Museum Lab. He's our designated, <laughs> we called him the designated survivor. He's over there. Um, he just moved in there. And um, we are going to actually share staff. Um, there is a, you know, studio lab. There's a tech lab. There's um, a space a make lab, which is like a maker, sh maker shop on steroids. And um, then a three-story climbing structure that is being made by a Slovenian artist who uses traditional bobbin lace making techniques. Ah. And she's creating this climbing structure that is actually in the stacks, what used to be the stacks of the library. So it goes up three stories. It's going to be kind of beautiful, I think. Actually, the, you guys all should come and visit because it's going to be beautiful. I, it's more beautiful than our building, which is hard for me to say because I love our building. Um, it's, um, and so what we're doing is we are hiring seven new people um, to kind of run that space, but they're going to be able to go between the buildings. Um, and, uh, and that's been great. So again, we're using our strength, right? We're using... We're not really hiring up in our, in our development department. We're still using our development department. We're not hiring in our HR department. We're gonna use that. We're not hiring in our, in our uh, finance department. We're using you know, the same people. Where we're hiring is on the floor so that we're trying to hire the best teaching artists and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, teaching artists it really is what, what we're hiring. Um, and so it's been great. And, you know, that's kind of a change that the museum made a couple of years ago. Instead of investing in stuff, we decided to invest in people. Yeah. That has made all the difference in the world. Yeah. So, um, yeah, more people. <laughs> well, you know, thank you so much. I wish I could be there next week. Um, thank you for being, you know, part of this inaugural webcast. Oh, it's fun. Thanks for asking. <laughs> you're, you're quite welcome. And Paul, why don't I turn it over to you since you're the Wizard of Oz behind all this magic. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Both Marsha and Jane. I'm going to put up our closing slide, but uh, I'm sure everyone enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Whoop, look at that. Uh, let's see if we can do that. Zoom, there it is. Thank you. So, um, of course, as Jane said, we should all go visit Museum Lab. Yeah, uh, next week. Week. Next week. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the week until you open. 
and uh, certainly uh, you have a wonderful opportunity. Uh, we put up um, links on this closing slide to um, both the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh and the Museum Lab. And also, of course, your opportunity to purchase <laughs> Partnership Power from Marsha. And if you, happen, <laughs> if you happen to be in New Orleans during AAM, you can visit Marsha at the AAM bookstore and uh, hear more of these partnership stories in person. So again, I like to thank you both very much. Uh, you, you have made my job easy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who tuned in. That was great. Your great your questions were wonderful. Thanks. It was fun. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care. All right. Thanks, Paul.